It's the 11th hour. It's down to the wire. I say it's high time. We make a deal. Let's get started. ba da ba ba da ba Hello, my friends. Welcome to Thumb Together TV. My name is Andrew Fantasia. Today, we're going to be talking about Succession Season 3, Episode 5, Retired Janitors of Idaho together. As usual, if you enjoy this video, please feel free to give it a thumbs up and give some love to that subscribe button as well, or else I might be forced to take away your private jets, and then we'll see who's laughing. If I'm only walking away from this episode with one takeaway, I'm walking away with considerably more than that. If I only had to give one note... My note would be this. Only the writers of Succession are so good at what they do that they can take an episode about a shareholders meeting and somehow make it not boring. I don't know how you do it, writers. But you did it. And before we dive in, I need to clarify something that I learned. I was under the impression that this was a full 10-episode season like the rest, but apparently after doing some more digging last night, I think it looks like this is only a 9-episode season. This is something HBO likes to do every now and then. They did it with Westworld too, which means since we've just watched 5, we are more than halfway done season 3 already. Yikes! Anyway... Shareholders meeting. Let's get into it. If this whole thing comes down to a vote, it is probably going to end badly for Waystar Royco because, you know, the Department of Justice is investigating them at the current moment. And I hope we do see more of that because, you know, you ended an episode with the FBI raiding the building. I know bureaucracy is slow across the board, but it would be nice to see some more of the repercussions of that sooner rather than later. So anyway, votes bad, deals good. Deals would save them. It would pull their asses out of the fire. Except the deal is coming from Sandy Furness, who is the biggest rival in town. And it's, of course, backed by Kendall because he knows it's more of a sure, secure thing than leaving it to votes. And Kendall does not want to inherit an empty shell of a company that's not going to make him any money. And our entire conflict here resolves around, are they going to take these deals? Because these deals get pretty petty. The Furnesses want to take away their private jets because they say it looks elitist and snobby. And I agree. And it just becomes this back and forth tug of war until they agree. Four chairs for Sandy Furness's team, a chair for Shiv, no private jets, who knows what else, maybe a snack bar, make your own Sunday bar. If Waystar Royco had one of those, season four is going to be wild. But what I liked more about this episode than the whirlwind of wheeling and dealing that it was centered on, and trust me, I do love that too, but what I like even more is the little tiny tidbits we got of everybody throughout. For starters, with Tom, we found out that Tom is obsessed with the idea of having a baby because having a baby would, I guess, cement him in the Roy family even more. It would strengthen his ties to Logan. It would strengthen his ties to the company and make him safer somehow. He really is trying to shield himself behind the fact that he's the father of Logan's grandchild so you can't really put me out to pasture. And I don't know if Shiv is really in the mood for making babies at the moment. I don't even know if she said she wants to have kids or not. It'll be really curious to see the back and forth that those two have further down the line. Because now that everything is safe for a while, they can breathe. They're going to start having to have this conversation again. Another great little tidbit moment that I'm plucking here is Connor. Connor is still riding the presidency train. And I'm still riding that presidency train. He's going to be president. You watch, he is going to be president. He had a great moment here that I loved. And then I kind of empathize with a little bit here is when everybody is rushing around and frantic because the president himself is calling and they're deciding who's going to talk to him. And Connor keeps saying, I'll talk to him, I'll talk to him. And nobody's listening. They are treating Connor like he is not even in the room. And even though all the Roys are pieces of crap at the end of the day, and I don't want any of them to succeed, I do want to see Connor be president just because I want to see what that does for the story. But I also felt a little bit bad for Connor there because it's like, hey, that's sad. He is a grown man and he is not even getting acknowledgement from the other human beings in the room. That's a, well, that's a sad state of affairs there, Connor. Next little tidbits are from Roman. When they go to visit Sandy Furness, who has had a stroke and he's in a wheelchair and he is not looking good, Roman is visibly uncomfortable by this. He's hanging back at the back of the room, kind of chewing on his nails, looking at Sandy like, oh, I I've never seen a person like that. And it's that classic little kid mentality. Roman is the most like a little kid out of the four siblings. He really has not quite grown up 
all that much. Just listen to what he says every time he opens his mouth if you need proof. So it's like a little kid seeing a sick elderly person for the first time or a dead body for the first time. He's just like, ugh, he's put off by it. He doesn't want anything to do with it. He wants to pretend it's not there. And he does the same thing again at the end of the episode when Logan looks like he's in a rough spot and he's freaking out and he's off his meds. And at one point he kind of passes out unconscious and he's just draped in his chair there. Roman acts the same way and he looks at him and he backs away and he's chewing on his nails and he even has a line where he says, can you just call me and let me know when he's not so scary? He is put off by the idea of his dad dying. He is put off by the idea of any old person losing their vitality and just sort of crumbling. And it's inevitable and happens to us all, but he doesn't want to admit it yet because he's still in that stage of development where that unknown factor frightens him to no end. So that's something juicy we learned about Roman Roy. And finally, I found a great little tidbit about our buddy Greg. Uh, it's something I suspected a couple of weeks ago, but I'm glad they kind of, uh, you know, addressed it a bit more, is that Greg, poor Greg, who seems to just be floating through all of this, uh, making the stupidest decisions in the world. He is nobody to blame but himself. He's his own worst enemy. Greg has a bit of a, a crush on Kendall's publicist, whose name escapes me at the moment. She's the blonde lady. But when, when Greg walks into Kendall's area there, wherever he's got his group and they're meeting and ready to watch the shareholders meeting, uh, he sees her and he goes, hey, hey, I, I, I was wondering whether you'd, uh, you'd be here again for this. Uh, yeah, cool, great, great to see you. And on his way out, after being devastatingly told by Kendall that he's probably going to be burned and maybe even sent to prison, he just kind of passes her by and says, see ya. And she doesn't even respond, which is very typical of Succession. Succession is a world of unrequited emotions. It is a world of non-mutual feelings uh, where one person pours their heart out or tries to get a point across and the second person that they're speaking to just goes, mm -hmm, or doesn't even respond at all. And as if that wasn't bad enough, Greg is now being told by his grandfather that he is just out because he, it's again, it's Greg's fault. He should not have done what he did. He should have stuck with Ewan, stuck with Ewan's lawyer, and tried to salvage something. Instead, he's swapping sides like he's Benedict Arnold. So, of course, Ewan is going to be like, you know what? You have not learned anything. you got to get your shit together. I am not bequeathing any of my money to somebody who's clearly not going to spend it wisely. I'm giving this to charity a good day. And again, Greg not being known for making the wisest decisions, instead of literally anything else, the first thing he jumps to is, can I sue my grandfather or sue the charity he's donating to? What I found so appealing about this, and what I think a lot of people found so appealing about this episode, is that we came really close to seeing the end of Waystar Royco. Had they gone to vote, it very well could have lost them the company. And when we were getting to that moment where the clock was ticking and I could feel the episode's climax bubbling up, I had a moment where I sat back and I thought, oh my God, are they going to go that route? Are they going to go the Shit's Creek route and take the company? And now we have a season four where it's the Roy's being poor. Is that going to be a thing? And I was you know, firing all these options in my brain. And I'm like, what would that show be like then? What are they going to be doing? It didn't go that route. Maybe for the best. I don't know. I still think that would be an interesting avenue to explore. What does happen to the Roys if they suddenly lose all their money? Uh, but I don't think it's an avenue I would prefer to the one we're on now, if that makes any sense. But it did make me realize something. We almost saw the end of Waystar Royco, and it hit me, not for the first time in this show's run, but for the most impactful time, it hit me that we know very little about the beginning of Waystar Royco. In fact, I'm assuming that, you know, this was a company founded by Logan that was just called Royco, because he's Logan Roy, and at some point there was a merger with another company called Waystar, but there's a lot of uh, shady areas there. And I know it's not relevant to what's going on now, but it got me thinking, and I'm a little bit curious. I normally am never ever one of those people who asks for prequels. I'm not. They love doing this in Hollywood. They love doing this in showbiz where it's like, oh, this is popular? Do the prequel series. Uh, show us a prequel of how this all came to and Normally, I hate that. Don't do that. Because the writers chose this moment in the story's timeline because it is the most 
interesting moment. They chose that moment for a reason. If you go back and do a prequel, all you're doing is choosing a less interesting moment. And that still stands here. However, having said that, I would be kind of interested if they made like a two season mini show about the origins of Waystar Royko. I think it might come from, I have a big bias where I'm really obsessed with New York City the way it was in the 1970s and the 1980s, the look of New York City back then. It was a very different world to New York City now. And I'm assuming that's when it would take place. The uh, the footage that, that we see in the opening credits looks like it's around there. Looks like it's an 80s kind of thing. So I would love to see something like that if we get a, a Royco in the 70s and then, you know, season one ends with this merger with Waystar. I don't know. I just, I just started going down this avenue and I thought this wouldn't be half bad. You know, you get a great actor playing young Logan. You get a great actor playing young Ewan because I'm sure he'd get involved. You'd bring back the mother. I think her name is Catherine. You'd make it a big deal when the company called Waystar comes into town and you know eventually they're going to merge. Again, it will not be as interesting as the show we have now. But coming from my little ball of bias, I do kind of want to see what this looks like. I don't know. What do you think? Would an origin story of Waystar Royko be something you would enjoy? Or would you rather they just leave that off the table? Whatever your answer is, I don't disagree with you. But anyway, that has been Season 3, Episode 5, Retired Janitors of Idaho. You have been awesome. I have been Andrew Fantasia. This has been Thumb Together. I will see you all here next week. And until then, adios.